There are three things you can do to help us out. One, you can make sure you subscribe to this channel. Two, is you can leave a comment here or on Apple Podcasts. And three, if you really want to help, you can follow this link to see how you could be a supporter on Patreon. Welcome to another Word in Your Ear. Now, we like to think that we help provide a little uh, light entertainment in lockdown, but one of the runaway success stories during the dark days and still going from strength to strength was, of course, Tim's Twitter listening party, now available in book form. And it was started by the great Tim Burgess. Tim, lovely to see you. And how are you? Or where are you? In fact, it's a hotel room, isn't it? In a, in a hotel, yeah. I'm in a place called uh, the Stafford in London, which is um, very nice. And uh, uh, so, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so, yeah, probably no records surrounding me, though, um, you know, um, uh, like, like, like you guys. But um, Dave's aren't real. I'm afraid we always say yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a green, green screen. screen. <laughs> it's, it's wallpaper. It's wallpaper. <laughs> Uh, but look, to, for, for the benefit of, of anybody uh, watching and listening who, who doesn't know about the the, uh, the, the listening party, explain yeah. when you started it and, and how you started it and how it works. OK, well, I mean, the very, very, very early days, you know, maybe about eight years ago, I was watching um, um, Four Lions the film Four Lions and uh, by Chris Morris and, and Riz Ahmed said that um, he, he tweeted um, the next scene where I get in the car, uh, Chris used um, uh, the, the shot where I laughed the least. And I thought, flipping heck, that's amazing. If I did this with a record, it'd be brilliant. So, so I, it was broadcast yeah, because, on TV. It was on TV at the time, and he just tweeted at the time it was on TV. Tweeted at the time it was on TV, and 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 I just thought, wow, well, I'm gonna see if I can do that with the record. And I asked my Twitter followers, and at that time I had about six thousand followers because I just started out. I didn't know what to do with Twitter, and I said, uh, I'm gonna do some friendly, a tweet along with some friendly. Does anyone think it's a good idea? And loads did, and they listened along. You know, I put the album on. And um, and tweeted through it. And, you know, there's great moments where it's just like, oh, baseline. And, you know, just tweeted that and, uh, you know, tagged, you know, track three or whatever. And I did that. And I did it lots of times over the past 10, eight to 10 years. Um, but on the week leading up to the first lockdown, I mentioned that I'd do our first album again. And uh, Alex from France Ferdinand said, oh, I love that record. I bought it when I was 17. At that moment, I thought, well, why don't you do one? And uh, you know, you can use my, you can use my, uh, um, uh, you can use my followers, and we can uh, guide it towards Franz Ferdinand fans, and and we can all have a good time. So you just announced, don't you, which album you're going to discuss, and you tell people precisely what point at time to start playing it so everybody is listening simultaneously to the record yeah. and you get those comments at precisely the moment that they're they're discussing in the track which is really thrilling actually hearing those little details isn't it yeah i mean and it's you know i mean i just i use the clock on my computer you know and that's when i press play and um you know even if there's a little bit of a, a lapse you know it doesn't really matter you know if people are a bit a bit late if they're listening in Colorado you know it doesn't really matter anyway you know as, as long as it's kind of almost at the same time and but as, re as regards lockdown it obviously really was very very thrilling for people a lot of them in isolation to think that they were all doing something commonly well, in, in real time at the same time exactly and you know I mean to have their headphones on it was like very it, we were all in isolation but people felt isolated you know even even with themselves in in that you know and um, so for them to have some of their favorite records with uh, with um members significant members or people who did the artwork or the producer tweeting along their memories and and uh you know saying oh this is a moment where graham coxon fell off his chair or whatever when he was like laughing so hard or you know and things that we would never know and probably they wouldn't have admitted when the album actually came out because you know you know, when you, when you put an album out, you're super cool, aren't you? And you just want you only want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good. That's a very good point. Well, ten years later, no one cares. You know, so it's yeah. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Because that's what Mark and I always used to complain about is when you interview an artist about their new album, it's always the best record they've ever made. <laughs> exactly. And then two months later, it's totally forgotten about or something. They've forgotten about it. And they're it. plugging the back catalogue furiously. <laughs> <laughs> and who can blame them? <laughs> but you've had... Uh, so which have been the particular... You've had some amazing success stories. I mean, you had McCartney. Was that was he hard to get? I mean, that, that was fantastic. Well, you know, I built up my confidence of asking people because I, I, I'd asked lots of people that I wanted, and uh, and but then lots of people were asking me, and there was you know surprise people asking, but uh, surprises asking me, and I, I can't think right now because I'm, I'm talking too fast. But um, so I was confident enough when I saw that McCartney had advertised that McCartney Three was coming out to just tweet to him and say, how about a listening party? And of course, most people respond immediately. And obviously there was nothing. <laughs> and uh, and um, until six weeks later, where I got an emoji thumb up. And <laughs> that's what, that's what <laughs> It's so McCartney, but it's a thumbs That's up. That's the official, official <laughs> McCartney Literally communication. It's just thumbs aloft. <laughs> and, and from that moment, it became, you know, about a week, eight days of frantic phone calls, um, you know, multiple Zoom uh, uh, calls and, 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 and a signed record, you know, uh, sent through the post. So it was an amazing thing. He, you know, uh, took part in it. He um, he um, he uh, really enjoyed it. He said some beautiful things about me, and and I, I'll never forget it. So All right, very Pat good. Minogue, um, uh, Iron Maiden, which was in, insane. It was trending at number one within about I don't know um, at, uh, one minute forty five of their first song. They were number one trending on Twitter. Well, it, heavy, really? the heavy metal community is a is a, it's a massively exactly. solid brotherhood, isn't it, and sisterhood. Really, really. It really is, and and um, we have a replay um, uh, um, element to the listening party on the website. That um, and within twenty four hours, they were number one by I don't know the the, the the second the second one was half of what they had. So and then you know the, uh, I think and then within forty eight hours, they were they, they were uh, bigger than the whole of the top ten put together. Wow! And is that presumably international? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, especially when Iron Maiden are involved. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I mean. I mean, have you noticed, you presumably noticed this spreading from country to country, have you, generally? Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it is international. Um, um, I mean, it started off humbly, in a way, by people that I knew, you know, Bonehead and uh, uh, Dave Rowntree and Wendy Smith. Uh, Alex Kapranos, uh, I think, was one of the others. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, and then it just kind of you know it just became open to everybody. Really, um, I wanted to make it you know a solid a solid thing as as, as it could be. Um, I imagined like running a magazine, but you'll tell me uh, probably otherwise. <laughs> and and uh, you know to kind of like you know build it up so it's like really it, you know made to be really strong. And then all of a sudden, I, and then I just let everybody get involved and, and then asked people that I, I wanted. So it was kind of, a, it, it was a group effort, really. I, I feel, you know, when Kylie came in and I was on my way to Rockfield to, to, to do some recordings and I had to pull over for like four hours just to sort out, um, you know, sort out Kylie Minogue's listening party that, you know, they gave me a couple of days notice. And, but, you know, it, you have to do those kind of things, you know, when, when it's a big artist like that. So you had Kylie, you had members of the Smiths and Go-Go's New Order, Culture Club, Tears of Fears. I mean, what are they, were there any that were particular favourites that you thought were just, you were really pleased with? I was, I, I'm, obs I, I was, um, it, uh, so I got a phone call from Ian Asprey, uh, Roisin Murphy and Gary Kemp all on the same day to talk about their listening parties. And Roisin has been like, she's been, you know, a, a, a runaway success out of the whole lot of them. She's been amazing and very entertaining. Dance videos all the way throughout. Um, in, incredible. But Gary Kemp, I never really knew much about um, Spano Ballet. I didn't know anything about them. I was listening to different music at that at that point. You know, I was listening to New Order. You know, they were my thing. So, um, but when I, I read his stories and was listening to 
um, True, the album, it just blew my mind. You know, it's really amazing. I didn't know for, uh, that their artwork was done. You know, I'm a big fan of Aztec Camera, and I, saw, and I saw their artwork together, and someone pointed out that it was the same guy who did it, and I was like, oh, my God, so similar, but, like, such worlds apart for me when I was like growing up you know I set camera with my, my thing and Spano Valley weren't but I love yeah. I love Spano Valley now I'm, I'm not going to say that their name again uh, as no, well. no. But, and Gary is just an amazing amazing he's guy. an amazing talker isn't he yeah <laughs> but there's something really exciting about there's a bit in the you mentioned the new order one there's a bit in the new order one where Stephen Morris says that the drums on on Age of Consent were cut and pasted from a Joy Division track I mean that I love things like that you know there's just <laughs> It's just because you you will then listen to that record differently. There was a bit, I think, it's Simon Le Bon, I wrote it down here, and he said, to his, I don't know which Duran Duran track it was, he said, it all begins with a blow to the naked strings of the Steinway Grand in Air Studio One, played backwards. And if memory serves me, it was Nick dropping one of his pixie boots from a considerable height that worked best. And that's a fantastic detail, isn't it? It really is, you know. Every time you would hear that track, you would just think of that, of that, of the, how they made that sound. And, and it's just uh, amazing. And Simon joining in on, on Hooky's Joy Division, um, uh, listening party as well and saying that he was at a gig you know an early joy division gig which you would never have known but yeah, simon made it a point that he would let everyone let the world know that he was at a joy division gig and yeah. uh, and, and Stephen as well um jillian popped in for technique and said that i wrote this song when everyone was at the pub or you know uh and it was uh dream attack my favorite song i think on uh on technique and but you know arguably my favorite song I argue with myself, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, just to know that because you know you as a fan, they they all credit each. You know it's it's split four ways. You know the credits, uh, so you never know who wrote what. But it's just the information like that was priceless, really. It is. And there was so one of you. Kevin Rowland, which was, was quite touching, really, where he sort of it seemed to revive his own interest in his own music. You know, he'd, he'd been made to go back and listen to it again in that detail. Really kind of really he felt was sort of really inspiring. Yeah. I mean, all lineups of all the three big decks is, well, I guess there's four, but, you know, the, the, the one that the, the, you know, the, the 80s ones, uh, late 70s and 80s ones. Um they all joined in, so there's nine for Young Soul Rebels, there's nine for Two Rye A, and uh, you know everyone joined in for for Don't Stand Me Down as well. And, and Kevin really reconnected with, and 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 mentioned in the big issue that he wasn't, you know, he wasn't uh, that keen on doing a listening party until he was convinced to do it. And once he did, he's like reconnected with both of his albums so much. You know, he can for forty years he'd never been able to listen to Young Soul Rebels. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It's kind of it's people relaxing about things that they've that's caused that has caused them tension over the years, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's pretty. I mean, with Kevin, you know, I mean, you you know, just how serious he is, you know. I mean, so it's it was such a huge compliment for him to say that the listening party got him to appreciate his first album again. He always thought it was too tinny. Yeah. Is there an advantage too about doing it via? Twitter, like, it just struck me that, you know, if you're in a room with somebody and you're talking to them in person, they yeah. can be much more self-conscious, and much more guarded. And I think you have the audience watching them or whatever. But if they're just tweeting, do you think you get more kind of off, off the cuff, more honest responses sometimes? From from the audience, you mean? From the, from the, no, from, from the, the people. Just the artists. The artists, yeah. the musicians. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that they think about it quite, quite a lot before they do a party. Um, and you know, I love Stevens. He, he's just so funny, and he and he brings out photographs that have never been seen. And he always talks about Rob, and he always talks about Tony Wilson, and you know, brings everybody. In. It, you know, I know that they've had quite a few arguments, New Order, over the past you know few years. And but he's always very cool about Hooky's you know involvement, and you know, he talks about them as if they're still to, still together that way. And it's just a beautiful thing. And and um, on a Joy Division one, Stephen joined in with Hooky doing it, and and it was like. They might have arguments outside the band, but when it comes yes, to... Yes, that might not have been possible in the same room. Yeah, and yes! There you go. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so you, you, say, you say you approach McCartney with via Twitter. Is that generally the way you do it? Or do you go through managers and PRs and so forth? No, um, it, it gets really complicated. I do everything through uh, DMs. Right. No, I, I, 
I've, I've approached people on Twitter, um, and I have approached occasionally on email, um, and but it's it comes through instant messenger, uh, um, Instagram, uh, Facebook. You know, it just I just it's it's complicated enough to keep track of it where it's all coming from. <laughs> I, I, I much prefer it if people just DM me, you know. Yeah, no, sure, sure. And you've got a kind so, of a, a hub now, haven't you? So you can go back and listen to any one of those records. And you just, yeah. it tells you when to start playing the record. And then you just watch those tweets appear yeah. as they did in yeah. real time. Yeah, yeah. action replay. <laughs> can you measure the number of people who are going back and looking at that? I mean, can you calibrate what scale the whole thing is on? We probably can't tell how many people around the world are involved. Well, um, so. You know, the, like, like I was saying, that um, Iron Maiden. The, the, there are there are fig, there are figures, um, and I think it was like seventy thousand for Iron Maiden. Um, That's huge. On on the and that was that was within uh, forty eight hours of, of of their listening party on the replay, and the one below that I think was John it was um uh was was McCartney. And that was in that was forty thousand, um, and then Liam was like twenty, and then I think John Lennon was, you know, uh, nineteen or something like you know you know. And it yeah, was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but there's, you know, one one and a half million I think replays at the moment. It's fantastic, right. and it's limitless. I mean, you're, presumably you're going to keep going. Why stop? I mean, this is just a. Up, yeah, I mean, I, 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 it got ridiculous during the lockdown, you know. It, but it, but you know, the lockdown was ridiculous anyway. It was several a day, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, did, I did ten. I did ten um, in one day, and that was for uh, for Sea Change Festival. Readers headlined Mid Lake. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 who, who else? Uh, yeah, Breeders Mid Lake. Um, John Grant. Um, I DJ'd. You know, whatever that means. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, um, there was so much fun and the broken record. You know that was all Spotify uh, um, crew. Uh, Boy George headline that, and um, uh, oh, I can't, I can't remember now. But this... so you've you've enjoyed it. You haven't thought at any stage oh, I've made a bit of a rod for my own back here. Well, of course. Um, well, I don't know what Rod for your own back means um, so much, but I mean, I, I've got, of course, it's been a lot of work. You know, at the beginning, it was 10 hours a day. Um, but lots of that was just o- organising and, and people, you know, and e- emails coming in, me responding, giving them a date, them saying, I can't do that date. And me saying, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and then, you know, lots of other things coming in and, and, and having post-it stickers and just being you know being a shambles at, at getting my dates wrong and all that kind of stuff and offering offering the same offering three bands the same time slot and you know it, it just got to me a little bit but it got the, the more I did it the, the easier it became and you know I, I um I, I uh, actually did a listening party uh, at the bus stop, um, uh, so that was instead of sitting in front of my computer, and I thought that was a big a big game changer for me. <laughs> that I could actually do it, do it quite casually, and now and now and, and and now I just you know it's you know I'm pretty on top of it now. It's 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 okay. I just look on my phone, just do, do it. Listen. And there's a book, there's a kind of book version which has kind of highlights of a uh, hundred of the parties, you know. And yeah. I think in the in the in the in the grand tradition of, of, of our podcast, we ought to ask you about some of the records that you really liked when you were when you were a kid. Can you remember the first records you bought? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was um, the first record I, I remember buying um, was the Great Rock and Roll Swindle, and um, you know, <laughs> uh, I went on holiday with my mum and dad. They gave me. 10 pounds and i didn't spend a penny and when i and, and when i got back i went to the local record shop and bought bought it for about i think it was 6.99 um so <laughs> <laughs> um uh, uh um, um buscox my nan bought me that um so that was the first sort of 11 12 year, years old you know um kind of uh then i like the you know the jam and lot, then lots of post-punk uh, Madonna, um, uh, then Crass and Flux Pink Indians and, um, you know, Subhumans and bands like that. They were the first kind of bands that I went to see. Um, yeah, what was the first gig you ever saw? 
It was crass at a, a, a scout hall in Winter. My God, crass. <laughs> a, sc- a scout hall. And a scout hall. That's in the deep end, isn't it, Dave? <laughs> 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 so, Jeez, that must have taken some courage. How old were you? Thirteen. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Well, you Did you scout. read the music press? Yeah, uh, everything. Just devoured it. What did you read? Uh, well, Sounds Melody Maker and Enemy. Uh, I read, right. you, you know, when that first came. And Paul McCartney on the front cover, the first edition. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, really? You bought Excellent. Wow. Yeah, the launch yeah. issue. Big news, you know. <laughs> it was. My mum used to work in a news agent, so she used to keep everything back for me. Very good. Which news agent did she work in? Was it a big one or a local one? Or? It was, it's not even, well, you know, obviously hardly any of there anymore, but. No, for sure. It was, um, I grew up in a village called Malton, M O U L T O N, and it's a um, postcode Northwich. And. Um, All right. Yeah, and uh, so very small small village yeah. kind of thing and uh you know can you remember the where did you buy records was there a, was there a shop there it's uh northwich underground market in, in in northwich um uh um and you know uh we go to manchester and uh go to the market in manchester as well and buy punk clothes and and, and seven inches seven inch singles um uh, I used to like, you know, second generation punk, uh, GBH, Discharge, anything with a kind of like, you know, terrible name uh, that was a teen for the for the teenage mind. <laughs> uh, and then you would horrify your parents. Yeah, exactly. And then you order age sixteen to change everything around. Really, I loved our set camera. Loved the program, the tube. Um, you know, right. pick, pick, you know, picked up records, recommendations from that. Um, used to go to the hacienda. Uh, big, big on anything from Manchester. Really, right, right, right. Wilson's fault, you know. And then I love started to love California music and music from New York and music and, and, and Berlin, you know. But again, Berlin because of Tube, I think, you know. Yeah, they promoted yeah. a lot of that stuff, didn't they? they? Did yeah, and it was really interesting, you know. Uh, for, for for me, between like sixteen and and, and twenty one, I imagine, you know, it was it was it was it was, it was the uh, the big thing. So are you, uh, apart from your listening parties, uh, what else are you doing? You're, you're about to tour, are you? Yeah, Charlotte, Charlottes are doing a 30th anniversary tour. I've just got back. Um, uh, yesterday was my last day of my solo tour um, for a record I put out, um, you know, in, in, in May uh, 20, 2020. What does it feel like to be back on stage again? Because I, I, I can't I imagine that some of the listening party was was filling that vacuum of wanting to be able to kind of get out and perform. Yeah, it was. I, I mean, mean, it's kind of therapy for, for you in the same way as I think doing this. We were David always saying it's oh, therapy yeah. for us doing our podcast and for the yeah, people yeah. listening and watching. It's just everybody's in it together, you know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it helped me as much as um, as much as it helps everybody else. You know, people have said some amazingly nice things about about the listening party and, and what it meant to them during lockdown and things. But it really helped me too. I was supposed to, you know, I, um, before the album came out um, in March, you know, I was supposed to go to South by Southwest and that got cancelled, but we were in New York doing uh, some warm up shows. So I'd started the whole process of promoting my new record uh, that was about to come out in May and it got pulled. Um, when I got back, uh, you know, I, I just thought, wow, what's, was you know i thought it was going to be three weeks that the uh, for a, a lockdown so I did some listening parties uh planned three weeks and thought that'd be it and then it just everything just kept going and they got big and and touring seemed like a thing of from the distant past or something like that and i just kind of i don't know i, I didn't know what to think really but it feels great being on stage now and obviously the same it feels the same but um I didn't think it would, but it did, and and uh, and I've enjoyed it even more so because of the uh, because of the time not doing it. You know, it's the first time in thirty years that I've not not been playing a record live. Yeah, yeah, but you've been doing this instead, this instead which is yeah. you know very well, important work. Very important work, and it's 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 fantastic how much how much attention it's got, and how many people have been really knocked out with uh, you know just how it's helped them get through the bad times etc for that you should be massively congratulated 
So, Dave, we always end, we normally end, don't we, with the greatest record of all time? Yes. Well, Should we do what, that? We, uh, could you yeah, nominate what you think is the greatest record of all time? <laughs> we put you on the spot there. God, I mean, I've just got like a, a huge blank. Um, <laughs> let me just go through. The Give top. us five possibilities. Well, I mean, I I do love, um, uh, I, I know this is like slow, but and and I don't want to say Beach Boys Pet Sounds, but there's not really no other way around it. Um, okay, well, fair enough. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, is, is it, that's that's it's a, it's a brilliant one. Um, five, I like Iggy Pop. Um, um. Which one though? It could be any. It could be. It could be any. You know, St Stooges. The first Stooges record with the uh, nineteen sixty nine on it. Um, right. I, I love that one. Um, Vashti Bunyan, uh, her record. Oh, I re really? Oh, what the, the the original one? The Diamond, Diamond Day. Diamond Day. Yeah, that's really gorgeous. That's an interesting choice. Wow. Uh, Judy Sill. You know, I'll, I'll, try to, uh, if I remember oh, rightly, Judy, she, uh, Judy Sill. Uh, oh God, yes. But the the the, the, the Vashti Bunyan. It's one of those tragic things where it took us so long, didn't it, to go up to Donovan's yeah. commune. Didn't she go by horse-drawn caravan or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah from London. To Scotland. Yeah. took her 18 months <laughs> to get there. <laughs> and there's a brilliant <laughs> moment when she arrives at the commune and uh, I think the day before they've all left. And one of the locals says, oh, you should have been here yesterday, all these amazing people here, but they've all just packed up and gone home. <laughs> and then she went off and made the record. By then, she kind of missed her moment. I think it all it all just gone. I took her. I, I, I took her to. I do um a festival within a festival called yeah. Peaks, and it happens at Kendall Calling. Uh, and uh, I asked Vashti if she'd come, and I knew she wasn't going to play live. But I asked her to come and, and talk to me, and uh, um, so I did a nice interview with her. And um, at the end, uh, the crowd just started saying, um, you know, sing a song, sing a song. And she was like, no, no, no. And she's like the shyest person. And in the end, she just did this a cappella um, song of uh, Timothy Grubb. Uh, I think um, I'm pretty sure the song was called. And it's just like the most amazing thing. You could hear a pin drop. And she was, like, she was overwhelmed that she had actually done it, you know. Um, yeah. But um, yeah. That's I was at her comeback show i think i think it was the first time she played for i mean really what 30 odd years wasn't it yeah. she did this were you there i wonder at the barbican no it no, was no. extraordinary i have never seen anybody so nervous in my life yeah. it was very hard to relax she was so wound up about it yeah 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 and, what and a story she's phenomenal story uh um you know she and she would you know she tells it so sweetly as well that they would you know pull over and just pick vegetables but it was a horse and car you know it's like <laughs> that's just right <laughs> and um uh but yeah judy sill uh the one with lopping around the cosmos that's beauty um i love ram you know i absolutely love right. ram I can listen to that any time of day ram yeah yeah, yeah. masterpiece yeah, it's a masterpiece and i love the way it's recorded monk yeah. moon delight yeah. incredible amazing that's the yeah. one that's the one yeah yeah they're all good but that's just amazing i i i i, I could i could happily say that ram was my favorite album of all time that's fair enough. I think that's fair completely enough. fair enough. You never get tired of it. You don't. So <laughs> many extraordinary tunes. It's yeah. absolute genius. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, what fun! It's been really lovely to talk to you. you and uh, we we will we will uh, enthusiastically, vigorously plug the book and uh, and your tour and uh, all your great works. Thanks so much for talking to us. Have you